Good morning, good morning. Thank you so much for tuning in with this week on Led by the Word. We are ending out First Chronicles. So we got the First Kings, the First Samuel, and the First Chronicles. We've done it, babe. I know, I'm excited. And we finish out Chronicles. We're getting into some of the stuff I'm really excited about in the Old Testament. But like I told someone this morning, they said Chronicles overwhelms them a little bit. I've enjoyed Chronicles more than Kings. Really? Yeah, I don't know. Deep dive. Like you said, we were um, talking last night about the Ark of the Covenant. Yes. And you were like, ooh, ooh. Uh, uh, uh. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> it's fun stuff. Points to the TV. I've seen this. I've seen I know. This before. I know about this. Um, we're in First Chronicles chapter 26. Oh, by the time this airs, you guys are going to know about this. We're launching our largest outreach yet. And what's amazing about it, it isn't even an Oasis outreach. Mm -hmm. It is a church outreach and not an MDT church. It's called Greater Love TV. And we're going to put it up on the screen. Pause the video. Take just two minutes. Go there and look at the website now. But Dad had a vision. And it was not all of America wants to watch mega churches. Mm -hmm. So this is an opportunity for rural churches to get on television. So we bought a TV station and you are going to be watching pretty much your neighboring church on TV. So you're in the middle of insert somewhere and you turn on that TV and there is your church ministering to you. And, and how exciting is that? Uh, I think 20 something calls yesterday to pastors and these pastors were just like, this is an opportunity for us. We're so excited. We're not taking this lightly. And we've got so many people on board that are excited to launch on greater love TV. Mm -hmm. If you're a pastor and you're interested, you can, email me. We'll put my email in the description here. But we're, we're loading up fast and this is just going to be an incredible, incredible opportunity. But yeah, be tuning in. August the 20th will be the launch in the live part of the station. Okay, First Chronicles chapter 26. This is fun stuff. They're choosing gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to Mitchell, the guy behind the camera and does the editing, and Jesse here beside me right now, also on the Seekers podcast. Go watch the Faith podcast. Really, really good. It was good. Choosing gatekeepers. And something that, what is it about the Bible in the East? Because hear me out. The garden is planted in the east of Eden. Mm -hmm. The cherubims are stationed at the east side of the Garden of Eden. Parts of the burnt offerings are thrown to the east side of the altar. The tabernacle's entrance faces east. Ezekiel's vision of God's glory comes from the east. And they also enter the temple in the east. You can get that in Ezekiel chapter 43. The same temple faces east with the river flowing east. And also the sun, of course, rises in the east. Also, he's coming back in the eastern sky, right? Yeah. So well, what? I know that I, I was like, wait a second, we've heard the east a lot. But what, what is, do you know the significance? I don't know, but it sounds like it's enough times to be significant. Maybe one day I'll get smarter. So in chapter 26, they're choosing the gatekeepers, and there's a lot. Uh, the east gate has the most keepers. Mm. But... If you all know that, comment it. I, I don't know. This is kind of new to me, this realization. There's probably some revelation there. Yeah, maybe it's like a geographical thing. Like if we zoned out, we'd be like, oh, of course. Of course there's more guards in the east because I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but there's something going on biblically. East is important. Right. East is very important. And I love how it's so important that even the nature of the sun rising of the east. So they're choosing the gatekeepers back to this. And I was, I was talking this morning about how sometimes it's hard to make a, si a decision. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, if you can't choose between these two restaurants, heads is this restaurant, tails is this restaurant, flip the coin. And that's what they're doing. They're saying, you know what? We're going to cast lots. And they're putting the decision 100% in God's hands. They're saying, this is something It's too big for me to choose. It's too big for me to decide, so I'm, I'm giving this to God. And when they did that, they put all the right people in all the right places. Mm -hmm. and, and I think sometimes we need to back up. I'm not saying cast lots. I'm talking about prayer and fasting and discernment. Right. But I think we need to back up in some of these huge ministerial leadership decisions, some of these family decisions, some of these job decisions, some of these home decisions. We need to back up and just admit, I'm not very good at this. Right. God, I need some guidance. Well, there's a way that seemed right to a man, right? Yep. And then, you know, we got to seek the Lord. And it can be the simplest of things, which I wouldn't call buying a house the simplest of things. But my family's done it enough to kind of the process. 
but you you always have to pray because you never know that shiny house could look so good and then it is ate up with termites so i mean simple things like that in the natural how much more this when they're like guarding basically the house of the lord where his presence dwells did they want to take into consideration what does god want we built this house for him i love that that they reverence him enough to be in the details i think some of the worst consequences we face is from ourself rushing into decisions. Never rush. <laughs> Never rush. Take time. Pray fast. Seek guidance. It's worth it. Oh yeah, 100%. It, uh, in the long term. Next, I've got to touch on this a minute, and I'm sure there's deep revelation in this. But besides deep revelation, this was the coolest way. Chapter 27, how they do the military divisions. Mm -hmm. So they take 24,000 people for each month. So, bitch, like you work one month in the military. And in the other 11 months, you can go home and farm. Mm -hmm. But they rotate out the men enough to where they're trained, they're prepared. It's like National Guard, but better. Tr I don't know. What, what do you think of this? The scheduling was really on point. When I read that, I was like, that just makes so much sense. There was no exhaustion. I mean, you gave it your all. You didn't burn out. Like, I loved it. Like, when I read it, I was like, yes. I'm reading a little bit right now about Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great knew one thing that was one of his keys to major victory. If he can go in and attack a country and they're like, okay, the only way we can win is throw everything at them. So he doesn't have to destroy them and win. All he has to do is keep them busy long enough to where their farmer's crops die. Mm. Then they ain't got no food. Mm. These guys were like thousands. This has to be thousands of years before that, before the Roman Empire and everything. These guys were like, here's what we're going to do. We're going to split it up. We're going to keep everything going food-wise. It was just such a a God structure of design. And I was like, man, we, we could literally learn from this today. I mean, it's the same with when they were giving them the laws of the land. Um, you plant these years, you give it a rest. When people implement that today, we still see huge fruitful benefits. Fruitful, because it's fruit crops. Anyway, um, so yeah, I love how that still translates to these principles are still, in the physical sense, applicable. I don't know. I love that. Yeah, so if you if you have any interest at all, deep study out chapter 27 of First Chronicles, military stuff. It was it was interesting, and it was, honestly, it was super wisdom. Yeah. Okay, I, I know Jesse has some thoughts for us in chapter 28. I want to turn it over to her for a minute. I cannot go to chapter 28 without touching this on 26. And I didn't know if you were going to touch on it, so I didn't mention it, but... In chapter 26, when they're doing the guards and the officers, and basically they're just planning out like the whole temple. And can I just pause and say, I really love how they had a layout before we executed the building. Gorgeous. We love the planning. We love the seriousness of it. So they're planning out, you know, this person's going to do this, this is going to be here, so on and so forth. In chapter 26 and verse 27, how are we going to pay for this, right? Out of the spools, one in battles, did they dedicate to maintain the house of the Lord. All that Samuel the seer, and Saul the son of Kish, and Abner the son of Ner, and Joab the son of Zeruah, and dedicated, and whosoever had dedicated anything, it was under the hand of Shilameth and of his brethren. So all of the spools that they won, because you got to think when they had these victories, they were taking their gold. They were taking all their stuff that they had, right? Because that was the spoils of victory, if you will, right? They took all of that and basically dedicated it to the house of the Lord. That's how they paid for things. That's how they funded things. That's how they had this happen. Because, I mean, it was huge. It was expensive. There's a cause. I read a quote yesterday, and it was, money is not imaginary. And that really spoke to me. <laughs> I was like, hey, man, so many people think money is imaginary. It's the real deal. It does cost money to, you know, maintain a church, maintain a whatever. I couldn't this was huge splendor. So I love that they took all that they had and gave it to this. Um, and of course, you know, the Bible is given for inspiration. And it spoke to me on a spiritual level of, you know, we should never forsake the assembling of getting ourselves together, right? Mm -hmm. Hebrews. But also, we know that the temple of the Lord is now us. His spirit dwells in us. We're the temple. And I was thinking about, are we claiming the glory like in our lives for the victories or are we actually rightfully giving credit to the Lord? So when you go through a victory, when you go through a trial, when you go through a test or what have you, you come out with victories. You come out with joy. You come out with peace. Man. You come up with gladness. I mean, when you think of Job going through all of the horrendous things he did, he came out double blessed, right? But what are you doing with that? Are you just keeping it to yourself? Are you saying, yeah, 
pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. No, listen, our righteousness is only as filthy rags. Anything good in me is because of him. Anything I have is because of him. All the good and perfect gifts come from the Father above, right? Mm -hmm. New Testament. So what are we doing with that? What are we doing with our spools from the victory? Are we just saying, yeah, you know, I kind of just got everything myself, whatever. I was telling our daughter last night because um, Micah's parents came over and we're doing some work on our house and making it a little bigger because we have two bedrooms and we have two different gender kids. So we got to figure out something there. And so she asked me, she said, why are our Nene and Poppy coming over to see the house? And I said, because they're excited about it and they helped us with it, you know? And she's like, I mean, like Poppy helped us, I guess. I'm like, shut it. They helped us a lot. They want to see the fruits of the labor. Like they want to be a part of this. And I can't just be like, oh yeah, Mike and I did all this by ourselves. We don't know how to tile. Mitchell's dad helped us with the tile. Like we had so much help from Shannon and Timber and so many people in the church came and helped. And we could just be like, oh yeah, we did all this ourselves, look at us. I mean, that would be a lie. So like when we stand before the church, we're like, I've heard testimonies where it's like, oh yes, you know, my cancer went away. And I'm like, we left out a detail there. We left out a very important detail that the Lord healed you. Like when we're standing before the church and edifying, it's so important that we give all the glory to God and not just let it come in ourselves because the enemy would love for you to have a victory and then just to squander it, right? Like Mm -hmm. not let it be for the edification of the church, not let it get you through the next trial of the faith. And I love how they, they could have just kept the spools themselves and been like, yeah, we'll start a GoFundMe and get this temple built, you know, from taxes or from what have you, only the people. But instead they were like, hey, we have these victories and these physical spools because of the Lord, we're going to use this to build up the temple. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't let that go. I had to keep going with that. Uh, it, it, it would be sad to go through trial, to reach your victory mm-hmm. and to not give credit. Right. Especially when the one that literally not only got us through the trial, the one that got us to the trial, through the trial, and to where we are now. Uh, God, God deserves way more credit than we give Him. I, I think this is me talking right now. And there, there's some scripture to back this up too, though. I think some of the biggest life-changing events can come from testimonies. Oh, yes. Have you ever heard a testimony that really turns you and you're like, oh, my goodness, wow. And, you know, I, I love sermons. And, and I love deep Bible study, but there's something about it is edifying. When you hear someone else say something, what they went through, I, I'll never forget a brother Nathan got up in church and said he never forgets the point in his life where he said, wow, this is all God. Mm-hmm. And I turned. And, and I remember going home and seeking God and praying about that. I was like, God, I, I ain't nothing good in me except you. Uh, we we got to understand what, what God's given us and what the enemy's trying to take away from us is on his side, the enemy's side, is fear of what we can tell someone else. Mm -hmm. And on God's side, it's the victory. It's the edification. It's the building of the temple in ourselves to show someone. Jesse, that is a deep, great revelation. Thanks. I feel like I kind of butchered it. You guys should have been there in my study time. I was in the moment. It was flowing. (laughs) You and Brother Clark should come teach that in Sunday school one day. Yeah, we'll have to do that. I would love that. I really love that. Uh, Chapter 28, I have to touch on two verses. Go for it. These are emotional verses. This just... This hits home. Mm. And then, honestly, I'm, I'm just going to turn it back over to you. Okay. and see, We're probably hitting some of the I same spots. I bet we're hitting the exact same thing. Okay, chapter 20. First, we're just going to talk a little bit about David. David was not able to build the temple because the blood on his hands. Yes. But God says, don't worry. I'm still going to go through your lineage. Yes. I love how even in David's punishment, there was still a victory in his lineage. And blessings. Yeah. So yeah. out of the uh, star of David, out of the scepter of Israel comes mm. Christ. And we see that even in David's mistake, God's like, don't worry. I'm still coming from here. Oh, I feel God now. So let's read chapter 28, verse 6. Is that where you are? Uh, I'm a little past that, but yeah, that's the general gist. And he said unto me, Solomon thy son, he shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Pause. We, the Bible, Dad says this all the time, how it's about shadows. And it's like foreshadowing and it's showing us stuff. Right here, God's coming down. He's talking to David, and he says, I love your son, but I've adopted him. Mm-hmm. And I love it. That's my son now. Oh, I mean, it's by that same spirit we cry out the Father. I read that, and I was like, ooh, Oof, chills. I know, right? Like, <laughs> I, when I see that, one, it, it, you feel God, but also it makes you so emotional because you're like, oh, my goodness, God loves us so much. He, I mean, we read it, but when you think about it, he literally adopts us in. Mm-hmm. And uh, I did a Game Changers on this. Uh, Clark was having an issue, and you weren't able to come that night. Uh Back in this time, in, in the, the New Testament time, an adoption is so much more serious than a child. Hmm. 
in, in the culture, if you have a child, you can disown it. Oof. If you have a child, you can be like, you bad, you messed up, you gone. <laughs> when you adopt, there is no process of disownership. Mm. So when you adopt, you really think and choose. And, and I love how God's just like, I'm bringing him in. And he knows the future. He knows about Solomon. But he takes Solomon and he brings him in in all his love and all his guidance. Now, we're going to read verse 7. It touches a little bit on some stuff too. Moreover, I will establish this kingdom forever. If he be constant to do my commandments and my will, uh, oh wait, and my judgments as at this day. I want to go ahead and read verse 8. Now therefore in the sight of all Israel, the congregation of the Lord, and in the audience of our God, keep and seek for all the commandments of the Lord your God that ye may possess this land and leave it for inheritance for your children after you forever. Mm. I, that's just amazing. Yeah, when I read that yesterday, I was like, Ooh. I kind of, I kind of want that verse on a wall somewhere. Like that's just that's beautiful. It is. I, have I ever? Have we ever? Is that like a common verse to hear talked about? I know I've heard your dad minister on this section before. Okay, for I, sure. But I love this. I. I don't know what part of, uh, of the world you live in, but we have what's called a Hobby Lobby. And this just seems like the Hobby Lobby verse. Yeah, why is this not in the <laughs> little plaque section? 50% off this week only. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, go ahead. Turn it over to you. I don't know. That just spoke to me. So I'm much. actually right in the next verse, but I do want to preface this whole chapter um, in verse 1. I'm not going to read it, but basically David gets all the princes, all the captains, all the officers, all of his sons. Basically, if you're anybody that's anybody, you're here, right? He has his mighty and his valiant men in this kind of like congregation. And this is in Jerusalem, which remember is like the central location, right? This is going to be the temple. This is where the ark is currently. So he gives like this amazing speech. In verse two, it says he actually stood upon his feet. So like, I mean, my man jumped up and basically was like, hear me. And this is verse 2. So he kind of gives the layout of, you know, the Lord told me I have blood on my hands. I can't build the temple. You touched on that. He is going to use my son Solomon, though. And I love this is not really part of my notes, but when I was reading it, I was like, in verse 5, it says, And of all my sons, parentheses, for the Lord hath given me many sons. I was like, ooh, I feel like that's like a, yeah, I'm blessed. I got a lot of sons. I got a big family. <laughs> he didn't have to say that. Look at me. Hey. <laughs> I'm, I'm super like, blessed. Yeah, I was like. <laughs> David, what are you doing? He has chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. This is really, 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 really important that David is doing this because he's also declaring not only who is going to build the temple, super important, but who's going to be the next king. Because usually when a king dies, we've read in the past, there can be some chaos, especially if there's multiple sons involved. Sometimes it can be like a whole play for the throne everything it's really important he's stating this and we know the story of solomon and, and his mom and the other yeah, brothers and... it can be messy so he's making this an important declaration he is not leaving it to chance there's no confusion no chance to question this is how it's going to be right so of course micah reads those amazing um verses six seven and eight if i could drop down to verse nine this is David speaking. I mean, directly to Solomon, right? This is the word from the Lord. And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart, with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Verse 10 says, Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build a house for a sanctuary. Be strong and do it. The be strong and do it, I have a confession. That was the very first thing that I have underlined or highlighted in this Bible. And we got these Bibles right when we started youth pastoring five or six years ago. It's probably been longer than that. And I finally highlighted it yesterday, which is really, it's a huge deal for me. The be strong and do it. What a commandment that David is standing up before God and everyone in this congregation and has given Samuel this charge, right? It's like very serious. Be strong and do it. And I know that this podcast is shared on a lot of social media channels that are youth centered, right? We have the Oasis lot right behind my head. So if I could speak to the youth for a minute. Yes. David is giving this charge to Solomon, but God is giving this charge to you. He's not asking you to build a physical temple. Okay. That, that's not what we're saying here. To preface what I said before about we are the temple, right? Man. He's called you to not only build your faith up in him, he's called you to speak to the lost, to win the lost, to speak to the hurting, 
to give them the good news. The gospel literally means the good news. He's called you to be this help in a troubled time through him. I mean, Romans tells us that we are more than conquerors through him. It's through him that he is calling you. When David was saying, Solomon, be strong and do it, he wasn't saying lean on your own might. He literally said in the verses before, if you follow the Lord's commandments, if you seek him, he will be near mm. to you. So I don't want you to feel like, well, you know, David was a man after God's own heart. You know, my father is a nobody or, you know, worse than a nobody. He's a bad man, you know, or my family didn't raise me like this. My family really didn't either up until I was almost 10 years old, you know. And when Mike and I first got together, that was kind of a point of, I didn't feel worthy enough because I was stupidly looking at my own self like, well, Micah was raised in the ministry or, you know, Micah was raised from a Christian from the ground up. That was something I was actually kind of concerned when Kara got saved several months ago, She, which is huge. We've been praising ever since. I'm like, I don't know how to raise a Christian. Like, and that sounds terrible, but I was like, I don't know because when I was Kara's age, it was a different environment. My grandmother and I were actually talking about this the other day. She's like, I bet you were wish like you were raised or like our family was like Micah. Like we had always stayed in church. We'd always been like that. And I was like, I did used to think that. But I know that, you know, my calling that the Lord has on my life has nothing to do with the way I was raised. It has nothing to do with my parents' decisions or their parents' decisions or even their parents' Amen. decisions. My calling and election is sure through Christ who has called me. It has nothing to do with my family. So when you think, well, I'm young, I can't do anything. And even if I was young, I'm not like so-and-so who was raised in the ministry or I'm not like so-and-so who was raised in a Christian home or, you know, my parents got saved in later life or my parents are deceased. You know, it's not up to you. It's not in your glory. It's not in Man. your ability. And the enemy loves to get us caught up in that. Like, oh, well, my self-worth is so down low. It's because your self-worth is not centered in Christ where it needs to be. And I sound really preachy, but I'm just coming through. I'm on the other side of this now, mostly. So I'm just trying to lead experience to you. So what I wasn't going to talk about this today, but what I'm going to teach in Sunday school the next time I teach, because this Sunday is a baby dedication, Yeah. in case you haven't heard. <laughs> uh, verse 11. So Solomon, build a temple. If, <laughs> if you give my kid blocks, not Legos, she uses the bigger blocks, and say build something, she's getting better at making structures, but it's very chaotic. If you've seen a, a four-year-old build something, it's it's not structurally sound. It's it's not good. No. <laughs> so some, sometimes in your life, you, you're doing something, and you need direction. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you. I was building a shelf for one of our buildings the other day for mom, and I had to deconstruct the whole thing because I missed two of the support bars if I would have read the directions. And what should have took, it said 20-minute project took me almost like an hour to build, unbuild, fix some unaligned holes that I messed up, and rebuild. David comes to him, and then David gave to Solomon his son the pattern. I'm so glad you're talking about this. So what, what I'm teaching in Sunday school is you guys are coming into this, not everyone's family uh, comes here. Some of these kids mm -hmm. come with other kids. Right. And I'm saying you're wondering, like, how do I do this? There is a literal step-by-step -step pattern yes. for the lifestyle for us. And, and this is what I love so much about God. If you meet a Christian from another country, from a totally different culture, you'll see so much similarities because they're following the same pattern. Yes. And I think that's so cool. I, I knew a gentleman, he went to Japan. And he was in Japan a while and he got to go to a bunch of churches. And he said, I couldn't understand a word they said. But he said, what was so cool is you'd be in the atmosphere. And these were just like Christians in our country. Mm -hmm. He said their worship was a little different. The teaching was a little different. But the lifestyle was the same. Mm -hmm. And it's because they're following the same God, the same pattern. So what I want to encourage you is read chapter 11. And you see David go into extreme detail. And I, this is about the physical temple. But Jesse said today, we're not building gold and marble and pearl buildings right now. We're building a structure in us. We're building a lifestyle. We're building a design for God to live in. We're, we're a light set on a hill. And we, we look at that and it's so overwhelming. There is no greater calling than to talk about our Lord Jesus Christ and to live for our Lord Jesus Christ and then to show the others this is uh, who I am. I, uh, God spoke to me a long time ago. I was probably five, six years ago. And God's given you a billboard, your lifestyle. And the advertisement is who you are and what you put on it. What's he going to think when he sees it? And what you can do is be like, ooh, that's tough. Mm. But you can design your life on this pattern of the Word of God. 
And thank God you don't have to figure it out on your own. Thank God <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> like, and for you guys that don't read directions, that will cause you a lot of issues in IKEA furniture. <laughs> so pack. it'll cause you way more issues than this. Yeah. Way, way more issues. I, I know we're coming to an end of this stuff, but talk to us a little bit about that. I was just going to talk in Sunday school. No, I'm so but glad I, you I'm touched glad on doing. that because I did kind of want to go into it, but my notes ended well. You and Kara came home from work, so I, I was like, <laughs> uh, and close, but I do love that. I love that, and it goes in verse 11, like you said, in verse 12, in verse 13. It's like, and also, and the pattern for this, and also the weight. Little, every little detail. If I could also switch gears a little bit and talk to parents. I know a lot of parents, I've been tempted to be like this, will be like, oh, well, I'm raising them in a Christian home. You know, it will be fine. It will not be fine, people. You had to be diligent with your children if I could speak as a parent because the enemy I think sometimes we forget and I've referenced this many times I've said it many times I apologize but this is where I'm at that spiritual warfare is actually a warfare you know like it's war like their strategy like the enemy has plans for your kids he has plans for you too but he would love to get your kids you know they're young they're moldable they're impressionable I was reading I bought a Christian curriculum for Kara to read or learn to read, excuse me, and it was saying how in the preschool years are some of the most moldable years. Amen. And how it's so important to give a love of learning in those years. And I was like, oh snap, I've not been doing that. But also, what about Christ? Is she seeing me read my Bible? Last year, the year before, when I read my Bible through in like eight months, which is impressive for me, but um, she would see me reading on the couch and she'd be like, oh, it's Bible reading time. Kid's four years old, can't read. She brings her Bible on the couch and she's like, da, 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 da. What is she seeing? What are, what are we, what is the pattern that we're laying out for our kids? What's the pattern that we're laying out for our friends? Because I can tell you in my own life, I've done things and the people closest to me rise up and do them too. I'm not saying like, um, I'm a micro influencer. No, I'm a nobody. But I've seen me do things and then other people be like, oh, okay, we have freedom to do this in Christ. Like, you know, we're going to worship. We're going to do this. We're going to read more. You have no idea the influence you hold in your immediate circle. It may seem like you don't, but I promise the Lord has given you people to build up, to edify. I've said that word so many times. To build up in the faith. Like, you have no idea. So what pattern are you setting in your life by your life? Like, what message are you setting? I love the billboard analogy. What are people seeing when you follow Christ in your life? Uh, I'm just, uh, we're coming to a close, but I just want to read this again. Then David gave to Solomon his son the pattern. Mm-hmm. If you're an um, adult and you're watching this and um, you have children or you have people in your life or you work in the church or you're in a Sunday school or you are literally got anybody around you, what pattern are you giving to the next generation? If you're the next generation, you're a young person watching this, don't be too prideful to learn from the pattern. God's Not only do we have a biblical pattern, uh, Paul talks about following those in front of us mm-hmm. as they follow Christ. We We've been given leaders in our life that we can learn from and we can use in this day and age to edify. Yeah, there's my <laughs> to word. edify the body. <laughs> so we, we got to learn from this pattern. I Honestly, I really thought today was going to be one of the shortest ones, but I really thought I was just going to take a lot for Sunday school. I'm really glad we went through this, and I loved your revelation. Coming to a close, thank you so much for tuning in. Greater Love TV is going to be amazing. I mean, right now it's amazing uh, talking to some of these ministers. Oh, I got to tell this story. I called a pastor and I was telling him one of the first calls, second call I believe I made. And I was like, listen, we want you to be on this station. I really think, he said, in a dream last night, God showed me a man was going to call me tomorrow and tell you your church is going to be on TV with a global outreach. And he said, I told the church and the church said, well, we'll see if it happens. And he said, here I am. It (laughs) happened. And I thought it was so cool. You already told people. I I don't know. I I got chills again. And I was like, I I called Dad instantly. I said, Dad, I got to be a part of the plan of God. I don't know. That touches me so much. I was part of the pattern. I mean, it's just verifying the Lord's in this. Yeah, Lord's in this. So excited. Thank you so much for tuning in. God bless you. God bless you.